Hi, welcome to the Iris Prize 2020 podcast. We love everything about queer film, and this year we've gone all best of British. I'm Robert Gershenson, and I'm joined by James Lucas, whose film Paint the Dragon's Eyes is shortlisted for the 2020 Iris Prize Best of British, supported by Film 4. The winner of the prize will get services from Pinewood Studios to use on their next short film, and all 15 shortlisted films get a UK-wide audience via Film 4 on all four. James, your short film, Paint the Dragon Eyes, it's a story about perceived outsiders and tensions between groups and cultures. What inspired this story? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and it's lovely to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Good to have you here. Why did I want to make this film? I... It was something inside me that it was a story that I needed to tell. It was um, conceived initially as a fable, um, and I was um, profoundly inspired by uh, some of the um, uh, British, great British painters like Con Constable Gainsborough mm -hmm. and uh, Turner. I wanted to make something, I wanted to use my voice to create a commentary of how I saw British society um, and and the situation that we've now found ourselves in, um, in terms of yes, ruptures in society and the the divisions um, that we we see, um, and also I'll be completely honest with you, I wanted to stick two fingers up to sort of you know um, some of the populist elements out there because that's just um, that's not how I roll, <laughs> and so I wanted to use my voice, um, hopefully for good. So what are these elements you mentioned? The elements, oh, I, you know, I mean, there's, there's a, you know, there's the the, the Trumps and and, mm -hmm. and some of the other other sort of um, politicians out there that, um, you know, a little bit nasty, a little bit um, intolerant, and um, I've never been that way. And what um, upsets me a little bit is the fact that um, they manipulate. Uh, the media um, for their own ends, and there's p probably people out there that are probably, you know, um, good, um, accepting people. That's um, their sort of rationale maybe being twisted somewhat by by these these people's messages. It's it's kind of that whole thing of um, you know, give 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 the give the give the mob what they want and uh, f for their own means, and uh, I don't like that, and I think that. You know, now is the time where we need to uh, push back against some of these elements and some of these people and some of these dark forces, if I was going to be honest with you, because they are. They are, yeah. I mean, I completely agree that, you know, people might not be able to see through the tricks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The mm. film has a bit of a dreamy, almost wild at heart feeling to it. Mm -hmm. And by wild at heart, I mean the amazing David Lynch film, not the Amanda Holden Saturday Night. No, all the TV um, drama. There's a good florist in our area called uh, Wild at Heart as well. But uh, yeah. Um, Plug. There you go. There you go. <laughs> That's uh, an extra £10 for me. The boys, they're in their own bubble. Yes. And then the outside world seems to just crash in and invade. Yes. I might be reading into it too much, but are you, are you wanting to reflect how, as a society, we are completely fractured and how culture just seems to be sticking with their own kind? Yes, I mean that's that's very astute. I conceived it as a as a fable because I wanted to tell a story that had layered meaning, mm. and I think the easiest way into that is to make it accessible. And so, you know, the idea is that you see this um, seemingly quite simple um, and and quirky. I, I get the, um, the the Wild at Heart reference, um, sort of journey, if you like. But as we go into it, it starts getting having a bit more meaning and a bit more sort of um, <clears throat> all the characters <clears throat> are, are, are kind of representative of different um, um, aspects or different parts of society. Um, and so we but we bring them into this um, fairy tale um, sort of ethereal yeah. world. And I think that's just what makes it more accessible. It's just a, a different way of looking at it rather than doing the sort of gritty sort of you know <clears throat> gritty thing i wanted to to, to express my views um in, in a slightly different way do you feel you're i mean you say that you, i mean 
I mean, I guess the obvious thing would be to do a gritty council estate mm. kitchen sink thing. Yeah. But you've kind of created, like you said, a fairy tale, a fable, and you're kind of very slyly putting in the message. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and, you know, I, I think I think that's worked. You know, it's even... It, it, Sometimes it's not, you know, you don't even, you get to the credits roll and you see that um, the person that conducts the, the, the marriage, mm -hmm. her name is Boudicca. And that is, uh, you know, Boudicca, the, the sort yeah. of legendary sort of um, uh, warrior, uh, warrior queen. Um, so they all have um, linked meaning. And another thing that was important for me as well, and, and this is where I took influence from um, some of the great um, uh, British landscape painters. And I would, I'd, was, became quite obsessive looking at these um, these guys' paintings in the National Gallery and things like that, um, was I wanted to take them out of this man-made world and have these two characters, our two lead characters, have this commune with nature. And it's, um, it's an interesting concept for me. And it's something that seems to thread throughout my work is this um, commune with nature. And it's interesting, when I was just away recently, I read this... Um, um, book on uh by um einstein and it wasn't uh, it wasn't um his astrophysics because you know i'm the type of person that thinks e equals mc cubed um <laughs> but nonetheless it was some of his personal philosophies and he talked about um not being atheist but um not believing in a anthropomorphic um representation of god but rather it's a cosmic interplay and so it's a um nature is 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 the beauty of order um, and it's this cosmic religious experience and I wanted these characters to have that religious experience this commune with nature within the film I think you, you definitely have that there's that awesome scene where Arthur is almost hypnotized by this this wide vast area of water hmm. and um, What's the other character called? Otto. Yes. Otto. Yes. So Otto can't get his attention. Yes. Because he's so transfixed. Yes. But it almost feels because the sound is is quite foreboding. Yes. In that scene, so it just almost feels like a future echo of of what they're about to experience. Yes, and also it's you know, ma uh, man um, and and the man made world grabs them and brings them. By the scruff back into the into the real world. This is their bubble. Yes. Yeah. And that's kind of um, hey, maybe that's that's just a, a realistic portrayal of you know life. Talk to me about Arthur. So the code lead character mm -hmm. is Arthur, and Arthur is black. Um, is there the possibility that the character could have been any race in a positive way? There's. I'm, I'm obviously coming at this from a position of white privilege, but when I look at Arthur's story in this film, there's nothing there that says this is about the black experience in the UK. Yeah. It's, it's quite a unique way, I think, of having a black character in a UK production. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. It was premeditated. I wanted his character, it's, it's about his soul. It's about his character. It's not about the color of his skin because that's, the way I, that's the, also the way I roll. You know, I'm 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 mixed race. I'm yeah. half black, half white. I've just told you about my uh, five percent German Jewish um, uh, heritage. It's not. It's something that's never. <clears throat> um, it's never been an issue for me. Um, I. I just see past it. You but see. Do you feel that? Because there's there's no secret in this country and America, mm. there is a real issue with having proper diversity on screen. Yeah. The default is always white when you read the script it seems that if you don't specify this character is black this character is asian this character is female the the default will be well we'll just cast a white person yeah how do we remedy that how do we make sure that you know that characters are black and they're not just black to represent all black people no exactly <clears throat> exactly I want people to be taken on their, their their own merits and their own character and their own uh, charisma and their own personalities. And how do you, as a filmmaker, yes. ensure that that's happening? By giving them roles that could be played by a, any any race, or you know, um, that that's kind of unimportant to me. I suppose, in one way, though, um, again, it is um, it, it is a probably probably my slightly rebellious. Um, side that I've uh, created this 
this this pairing, this interracial relationship. Um, for all the people out there that don't think black people <laughs> should marry white people and 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 all the rest of it, you know, um, it's like sticking two fingers up to him. Yes. Yeah. And I guess that's your prerogative and your great position that you're in that you can do that. Yes. Yes. And I, you know, I, I don't think people should be afraid um, of, of doing that. And uh, that's not, you know, I don't feel that we always need to walk around on eggshells or be mm. patronising or, or uh, generalise. I think, you know, let's let's just get back to the craft, let's get back to the story, let's get back to um, humanity. Excellent. Mm. Talk to me about your writing process, because you started off as a writer. Yes, so absolutely. Is, do you find that the easiest? Or, I mean, well, I know when I write, I can bang my head against a brick wall. Yeah. Sometimes it flows like water. Mm. Often it's dripping like honey from a jar. Mm. Yeah, um, I find, I, I'll be honest with you, I'm, I'm great with ideas. I can come up with an idea at the drop of a hat. Um, that's no problem. Um, I find the actual process of writing, having learnt the craft, it's very laborious. It's, it's, it's I, you know, I, when I first got into it, I thought I'd just be swept by inspiration. I'd flounce downstairs <laughs> and, you know, whip out a, a script here, a, a script there, and, but it's, it's not like that at all. No. It's, it's, it's a grind um, to get the actual mechanics, the actual structure in there and, and get it all down on, on, on the page. So when you have that spark of an idea, yeah. do you let it percolate? Do you immediately write it down? Do you start structuring it, let's say, with a fray tag? Or do you just go sort of hammer and just, just try and, let's say, hit a word count per day? Yeah, I guess um, what what I do first is I have this idea. I I I go deep into that idea. So for me, a lot of the things that I'm doing, um, you know, I'm I'm about to um, I'm sort of prepping a film um, about Kate Moss and Lucian Freud mm -hmm. uh, when she sat for Lucian Freud, um, the painter, in 2002. I go I go there. I, I go deep into that uh, research. There's lots of research. Lots of research. There's not even before you start writing. Yeah, yeah. Because um, I suppose for me, everything um, that I write has to have um, authenticity. Mm -hmm. It has to be real. I have to know what I'm talking about um, in order to to get it on the page. And I think that's something that you'll find in um, a common thread throughout all my writing is honesty, uh, realism, and authenticity. Is Kate Moss involved? Oh, yeah, Is absolutely. the painter involved? Yes, yes, yes. They're, They're happy uh, to uh, have that story developed? Yeah, she's, I mean, Kate's been um, um, amazing, actually. She's been great, um, really encouraging. And, um, yeah, we have... Um, her on on board and also the uh, Freud estate which is great which is great yeah it's really exciting something like that I imagine with two big names behind it funding will be relatively easier I would I would I would hope so you would hope so, so you yeah. haven't got there yet uh we're just in that process now just about. But my, my producer would be able to tell you more than <laughs> than I would be able to yeah. with a short like paint the dragon's eye yes when there there is no one noticeable no one famous let's say mm. in the cast mm. how difficult was it to get the funding um well I, I do believe um in filmmaking um story is always number one mm -hmm. and if you have that story down uh, nailed down and it's it's exciting it's interest interesting it's intriguing and it is it's, it's it's special then i feel like people come on board um and, and that's that's kind of um, what I've done in the past, and and I was able to lucky enough to have some um, friends and and um, family around me that wanted to support this film for all the right reasons as well. I mean, so add. you as the filmmaker, because I imagine you co-produce as well. Yeah, well, yes, yes. So you've got to be the world's greatest salesman as well as a storyteller. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I think people who know me know that I'm, I'm pretty committed to my craft yeah I'm pretty committed to what I, I do and I, I like to entertain people but have a um, it's important for me to have a message as well yeah in, in my writing and and people um, yeah do they really respond to that I think so I yeah? think so yeah this was your directorial debut you've yes. been involved in in productions across the board yeah quite a wide range but this is the first fiction you have directed so how did you feel stepping into that role? How did you find your directing style? How did you find working with the actors? Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't know how it was going to go. As you said, I've worked in production for many years. I worked for Ridley Scott for mm -hmm. 12 years, making commercials and music videos. I'd always seen it from afar, if you like. Um, <clears throat> to be there in the room <clears throat> as the director, 
it felt very natural, um, only because it was a natural extension of the writing, of mm -hmm. the story. So I was there physically to make that story um, take place, to occur, to happen. And um, in terms of working with actors, I, I, I love that because, you know, it get, it get re really deep down and, and, and soulful and spiritual and, you know, um, really get into the characters. I, I enjoyed that a lot. I really enjoyed the characterization and working with the actors. And being on set, I, I, I was, you know, I, I'm quite well versed on being on set. And, you know, but I, I, I learned so much at the same time. I learned, you know, how important your team is, yeah. um, essentially. Um, that was one thing that, you know, you're only as good as your, your crew, I think. Um, Did you find it at all overwhelming? You know, people are coming to you with questions and you've got to have the answers or at least make it seem like you know the answer. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I don't do things by halves, so I don't think. And um, I, I chose, um, you know, to make a film, my directorial um, debut. I decided to do one with uh, motorbikes, children, multiple locations, shooting in London. Um, drone shots. Drone shots. It was the works, basically. It was a very busy shoot, let's mm. put it that way. I don't even think I had time to even um, be introspective. I just had to... Just autopilot. I just had to get, get, it, get it on. Yeah, exactly. So when you first assembled the rough cut... Yes. Did you get that feeling of dread of, oh, God, I haven't got everything I need? Yeah, I mean, the, I think the, 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 the production was so tight... I would have liked to, with hindsight, would have liked to have had a little bit more time. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's, it's the, you know, they, they say you make a, th a film three times. You make it um, in the script, in the production of it, and also in the edit process. And really, it took a while in the edit to get it to, 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 to how I wanted it to be. When did you realize you were happy with the cut? Um, yeah, I don't know, really. I, I, just, I just, when I, I, I suppose I just sat down and watched it quietly, probably on my own, and thought, that's kind of cool. I like that. How long after locking picture was that? It took a long time. I mean, it took quite a while to get the edit right, mm. to lock um, the picture. Um, and then once you had it locked, how long were you happy? Because sometimes you need that, that space to look back on the project and go, actually, you know what? Yeah. All that nonsense... All the whole. I just want to concentrate on the donut, not the whole. Exactly. You, you get sort of you zone in on things, don't you? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I I locked um, the edit, finished the film, and then I did. I haven't. I didn't watch it for a while. Um, I watched it quite recently, actually, for the first time in ages. And again, I was like quite charmed by it. I thought, yeah, this is this is uh, this is me. I've got a, <laughs> You're happy. I've with got it. quite an interesting voice, haven't I? You know. So yeah. And I I was I was quite happy in in the sense it's not perfect. I, I would never mm -hmm. profess for it to be perfect. Um, but it's got soul, and um, I'm kind of proud of it. Um, I'm proud of it being part of a, a zeitgeist um, um, uh, for positive change, and, and and all these other things, equality and so social inclusivity and things like that. I'm going to go out on a limb. Yes, you're married with kids. I am married Two with kids. Two young boys. Two young boys, Arthur and Easton. How old are they? Um, Easton is five. Arthur is seven. So I'm I'm assuming you identify as a straight man yes 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 excellent so i'm not overstepping the mark or anything no 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 it's, it's actually fine. <laughs> has there been any feedback or reaction to a straight man directing a film in the lgbtqi plus genre well i'd be interested to hear really i don't know i haven't um um come across any criticism so to speak but i'm you know i'm all ears uh as i said i, I think there's for me, I'm a, I'm a, a bit of an empath, I'm a very empathetic person, and um, you know, sort of the, the gay community is um, people I, I love and respect. I have all my life. You know, I've, I worked in um, the fashion industry, and 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 you know, I've, I, it's just when we, you know, we were talking about race, um, and I, I see sort of past colours. I also see through sexuality it's yeah. basically what i mean is it's it's never a problem for me it's never an issue and um to be honest with you gay people have probably influenced the the, the um um have a, a, the biggest influence in in popular culture um and they have from the off start since house music to to whatever you know it's cool people man awesome thank you very much yeah no, <laughs> definitely so let's go back where did you grow up uh i grew up in um new zealand <laughs> So what brought you over here? Well, I was born here. I moved to New Zealand when I was um, 
five. And okay. I grew oh, up. Oh, right, so your parents took you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You did suddenly go, you know what, guys, I'm out of here. I just got a ticket. I'm out of here, guys. <laughs> um, grew up in New Zealand, which was great fun. It was very, uh, yeah, it was, it was definitely a faraway place, especially, you know, in the 80s where I grew up. It was, um, but, you know, that's it's everything for a reason. Um, I grew up there. Um, I played a lot of rugby. And then uh, I, was, I was all set on being all black. I went to a school where they do produce all blacks and, and, and I was pretty much there. And then I um, had a motorcycle accident and that was the end of my rugby career. And I thought, oh, what should I do next? But I'd always had this passion for storytelling and writing. And I think that's when I seriously got into um, film. So you were a cinema kid? Yeah. What uh, films? When I was growing up? Yeah, I mean, we the were, big ones. Well, yeah, we were, you know, spoon fed all the, all the Hollywood films. They were, yeah. they were events, weren't they? You know. So you would have been growing up in the 80s? Yeah, so, so Spielberg. Spielberg. Yeah, yeah, all the Lethal Weapon films. Yes. Uh, a lot of um, um, horror films. Uh, I used to uh, watch so a lot a of horror films. Yeah, exactly, all that yeah. kind of thing. And Halloween and um, um, Evil Dead 2 was always a, a good one. Um, what age are you? Uh, 44. 44, okay. It's not too, we're not too apart. Yeah. So similar, similar references. Yeah, yeah. And also I... I I um, I was allowed a TV in my room when I was very young. I don't really know why, but I'm not going to argue. Um, <laughs> but we watched a... I watched a lot of films just on my mm. own in the evening. But when you were watching them, were you thinking... Really obscure oh, stuff. This is, this is what I can do. Or when was that spark? When did you realise, that's, that's what I'm going to do? Okay, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you when. I, I remember um, very clearly watching the Oscars on my rickety TV in my bedroom. I think it literally had a, a wire coat hanger as an aerial <laughs> and I thought that I'd like to do that one day what year what year was that <sighs> I don't know I must have been about 10 11 something okay. like that yeah and I thought yeah that looks that looks cool I'd like to I'd like to do that and so in a weird roundabout way I sort of um you know went on the, on, on that quest so what was what were the first steps writing or did you start making short films with a little video camera yeah no <laughs> film school film school yeah I went to um, uh, uh, Metropolitan University, I think it's called now. Used In London? Call. Yeah. But that, that would have been... I came, that's when like I came back. Year. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, whilst I was uh, a kid, you know, yeah. I, just, I just carried on watching films and just was just acting like a kid, basically. Just letting it seep in. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So when you, got to, when you got back to London to go to London Met, yep. talk to me about that sort of film school, that course, because sometimes film courses can be... A little bit ropey. Other times they are bang on the money. Yeah, this one was uh, probably on the more ropey side of things, mm -hmm. but um, I think the thing about it was that they didn't have um, any equipment really. Um, it was, and it was more of a theoretically based. So it's quite critical. Film studies kind of course. You weren't making films. I made a couple, but yeah, I mean the, the emphasis was on on um, on theory, um, but. I have to say, for that reason, I did learn a lot. I, I learned a lot, and you know, I still have to this day have a, a great love for French New Wave and um, just getting a little bit deeper into films and their meaning. And so they were showing you things that you hadn't even considered before. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, and that was that was cool. That opened my eyes to a lot of things. Like um, one of my favourite films, still to this day, is um, Hiroshima, Hiroshima Mon Amour by uh, Resnay, which, um, which which I first saw in you know at film school. At film school, yeah. What's the greatest lesson that you learned from film school? Um, I think the devil is in the detail. It's all about knowing your craft inside out. Mm -hmm. um, and that's definitely going to help. And, and, you know, for sure, whenever I'm, I'm making something or working on something, it's, I get deep into the research side of things. Um, you become obsessed. I become it's obsessed. It's a rabbit hole, isn't it? It kind of is. It, it really is. Um, yeah. Which I enjoy, though. I don't yeah. know. There's some kind of like geeky side of me that I, I just love getting, in, you know, getting involved and 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 reading all I can on a, on a on a given subject. I think a lot of creatives are like that. I'm I'm kind of like that. It's yeah. a good greedy. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, yeah, I get excited definitely. You know, you can't devour it fast enough. Mm. Post film school, mm. did you immediately jump into a film job, or did you work in Starbucks or Morrison's or whatever something? Just to buy that that gap. Yeah, I, I was I was lucky. I one of my best friends um, at college, um, sixth form college, 
his sister worked for uh, RSA Films, Ridley Scott's um, ah. commercial company. So that was my in, basically. So immediately, pretty much soon after, yeah. Forty Two Beak Street, exactly. You get oh, in yeah, there. yeah. yeah. Uh, I was there. I was there for, um, and it turned out to be uh, twelve years. I was there. What were you doing there? Because I, I, I mean, from my knowledge, it's not just about Ridley's films. It's a whole production company. They probably work on more stuff that's not his than his. Yeah, well, his his film productions are run through Scott Free Productions. Yeah. And then RSA Films, where I worked, um, and Black Dog Films were the um, commercials and music videos. So you were writing them or uh, immediately No, no, I, I just came in as a runner. Um, yeah. And I worked in that capacity for a long time. Then I actually um, became the MD's uh, PA mm -hmm. for a number of years. And then after that, I worked in um, a bit of sales and PR and marketing and then a bit of production and executive producing. So... Almost like that's an MA in filmmaking, exactly. Right there. Yeah, it, it, it so is. It's, I, I, I say that actually. That was my, yeah, yeah, my degree in filmmaking, my master's in degree, um, master's in filmmaking, and it really was. Um, and to see it in you know happening in front of you uh, in real time is, is kind of invaluable. What's the culture like? Are they, I mean, if you were to turn around, I don't know if you said this to them, you say, I really want to direct one day, do they say? not here or okay well let's start cultivating you because you know you are potentially the future yeah it's, it's, that's a, it's a good question i mean you're there to do a job there's no mm -hmm. question but i mean i'm a, a resourceful type of um chap and you know i've always believed use what's around you so all the time i was doing my day job i was sort of maneuvering myself in a position where i could um um branch out and, so you, and, what, you were making shorts outside of work or? Yeah, and I was, you know, the, the, there was a stable of directors there and I would hang out with those guys and, and chew the fat and talk over ideas and stuff like that and, and get their sort of insight into things. Um, so I learned a lot from those guys as well, mm. from the directors and the whole creative process. Just by sheer osmosis. Yeah, I mean, and just asking questions and, and, and just asking to be around. You know, I was kind of that annoying guy that wouldn't go away, <laughs> you know. I think we're all that guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think you have to be. You have to in be. Any, I mean, it's in any industry, that's, really. That's the, the, uh, the desire and mm. the ambition, I suppose. Yeah. So you wrote and produced a short film called The Phone Call. Yep. So... Was that with the help of RSA? Or? It was, yes, yes. Um, and it was one of the RSA directors. So what I just said a moment ago uh, came to fruition in the sense that we decided to collaborate, Matt Kirkby and I, mm -hmm. on this film, The Phone Call. So he was already directing at, at Ridley Oh, Scott. yeah, yeah. He was quite a successful um, uh, commercials um, director and music video director. It's about a Samaritan-style helpline. Yeah. Uh, there's an operator played by Sally Hawkins, and yep. she's on the phone to a man in crisis played by... Uh, one of my favourites from Only Fools and Horses, Jim Broadbent. <laughs> How did you get Sally? How did you get the great Jim? Yeah, we were very lucky. Um, Matt only wanted to work with Sally um, Hawkins. That was his list was like one name long. Wow. Um, and we did approach her, um, and she was quite interested, uh, and she, she liked the script. And then she got sort of swallowed up by Hollywood for a while. There, she did. Um, I think she did Blue or Orchard. Orchid, um, and then Blue Jasmine. Uh, Blue Jasmine, sorry, the Woody Allen film. Yes, yeah, and uh, excuse me, and also um, Godzilla, and she just went into this hole, and uh, we didn't hear anything for about almost a year. Yeah, and we were pretty close to just shelving it. Okay, that's, really, it's not going to happen. You know? So he wasn't even willing to say, "Well, I want to do this film, but you know, if Sally can't do it, maybe we, we hadn't even approached him. But we hadn't approached him by that point. It was just, but 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 Sally, you wouldn't, we wouldn't choose anyone other than Sally. That's what the director Matt, that's yeah. who wanted. And then um, suddenly, you it's know, dedication. it is, um, he's quite stubborn, Matt. Um, uh, anyway, <laughs> she uh, suddenly out of the blue contacted us and said she has this, this, this two week window yeah. um, be between productions. Would we like to take it? And we're like, God, yeah. And so it was all, all, um, all hands on deck. And then uh, we approached Jim pretty shortly afterwards. And he was like, he, he, I think it took about 48 hours to say, yes, he wants to do it. He liked the script, yeah. or was it the fact that Sally was both, involved? Both, both those things. Both those things. That was enough for him. And you were still at RSA when you were doing this. Yes, so yes. You were doing your full time job and a production, which is like yes, a one and a half full time job. Yes, and I just had um, we just had our first child as well. Arthur. So when did you sleep? <laughs> yeah, I didn't sleep that much. <laughs> In between the edit. Yeah, but it just had to be done. Had to be done. What sparked that idea? Because it's quite a specific 
thing mm. to write about someone who works on the Samaritan's type helpline. Were you more interested in the Sally role or the Jim role? Um, uh, you know, going back to uh, um, having a strong sense of empathy in my work, it was really about a connection between two people, two mm. souls, um, and, and their relationship and how it developed. Um, it was my mum had worked at a, um, um, a, a helpline, and that was kind of what um, started fermenting my imagination. And I just thought that it was a, it was a not really seen before, um, really interesting setting for a really emotive story mm. that goes again, it goes deep. Um, you know, it's it's raw, it's 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 real, and it's um, yeah. I mean, we're all going to love somebody, and we're all going to die, mm. and that's what I did. In there. I didn't try to be too cerebral. I just wanted people to experience and feel the film rather than critique the film. It's quite an unusual setup. Not the film, just that kind of thing. You're getting so emotionally involved in someone, mm. and the only connection between the two of you is a voice. Yeah. So it's it's um, it's almost an odd choice for a film because film is so visual. Exactly, yeah, yeah, and that was you know one of the challenges as well is how to to make it filmic. Mm. But um, I think you know we worked with a, a great cinematographer, um, Ula Birklin, um, who's gone on to do things like Judy and American Animals. He's he's fantastic. Um, so yeah, we I think that also the the, the drama is so distilled and so real and so raw. That's that's part of the film story. You know, that's a large part yeah. portion of the film story, um, and it helps having two powerhouse actors. Yeah, and they were they were they were there. They were they were committed. You know, it was. So you had them both in the same. Yeah, room? Yeah, we had them. No, we had um, Jim in a in a side room, and they were, but they were mic'd up, so yeah. they were having this conversation. So it's almost a live conversation. Yeah, yeah, it was it was it was real. It was it was cool. I'm gonna say it. Mm. There's an elephant in the room. It's a gold coloured ele elephant. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> the short bagged you. And director Matt Kirby, an actual, real life, very shiny, very heavy Academy Award. Yes, that's Best right. Short film of what was it? 2015. 2015, yeah. 2015, yeah. handed to you by Jason Bateman and the amazing Kerry Washington. Good research. <laughs> How long did it take you to piece your mind back together after it exploded? I don't think I ever it'll ever be pieced back together. Um, it's it's just, you know my wildest dreams came true. As I said, I had this you know. When I was a little boy, I just yeah. you know wanted to do that, and to actually go up there and 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 do it is kind of like, it's um, it's kind of hard to put into words, because it there's there's a sort of validation aspect of it and affirmation for all these years that you put into your you know your work and your craft and yeah. your, your your love and your passion, but it's just um, it's just so it's so it's so big, it's so big, it's so big. I'm so proud of it. Is it overwhelming? Do you do you feel well now? You know, I'm an Oscar winner. I have to live up to this gold statue and everything that goes with it. Well, in a way, but really, um, I've done it, so I don't really feel that um, I need to prove myself to anyone any longer. Um, but I still want to entertain people, and I still have a message, and I still have a voice, and I still have ambitions. There's still other things that I want to do and make, and I want to use my voice for good. Mm. And if that means you know, using the Oscar in that capacity, then I will. Did it kick open all the doors? It, it does open doors, yes. Yeah. I mean, it has the actual physical object, the Oscar itself, has a, a very strange, mysterious power and aura. If I, if I get it out and just... Um, in a room, in a room full of people, and just pull out this Oscar. People go a bit, just look at go it. a bit weird. Where'd you keep it? It's um, locked away. Oh, really? Yeah. It's not on display. Well, no. no. Kit Winslet keeps hers. In I'm, I'm her, it's, her so, it's so toilet. precious to me. I don't, I don't get another one. If I, if I lose it or it gets stolen, I don't get a replacement. You see, so I'm very precious about it. Um, and I, I do live in Hackney, you know, and it's, it is a very gentrified area these mm. days. But you know, it's still got a rough around the edges, which I like. But I like my Oscar even more. You see. <laughs> Um, how do you make sure that when you're in that position where all the doors have just been kicked open that you choose the right project you don't just take you know the big money that comes or the big contract yeah well it's the, that's a good question I, I, and the answer is you don't I didn't know jack shit when I um, after I won the Oscar I won this Oscar and I didn't really know how to make long format film yeah and so I had to, I spent the next sort of two to three years sort of just trying to cobble together stuff quickly and, and 
putting together projects that I didn't fully believe in and I was trying to please other people um, and all this kind of thing. And it just it wasn't really working um, for me. And it was it got, it got a little bit frustrating there for a while. Um, but it wasn't, it was when I sort of took stock of it and, and you know, that sort of learnt my craft, you know, um, screenwriting and, you know, uh, directing. I started, you know, realizing I have, I have my voice. That's why, you know, I was That's lucky enough to win this Oscar. Place. So let's return to that. Yeah. And, and, and not worry so much about what other people um, think and say. And that's kind of worked really well for me. And I, I would say that to anyone, just, you know, believe in yourself. Uh, yeah. Do you think the fact that, you know, you, you are not a, and I don't, I don't mean this disrespectfully, mm. you're not a Hollywood name. You're not, you know, you are not Ridley Scott. No. You don't, your name is not a brand to, to itself. So winning the Oscar now can work in your favor because you don't come with all that baggage. Mm. Is, do you think that is a, a, a positive way? If someone is going to win an Oscar, you've kind of done it in the, the best possible way. Yeah, uh, I, I'm, I'm not an auteur. I'm not an auteur yet. No, I mean, I wouldn't say you're not an auteur. I just mean, you know, you are, your name isn't David Fincher. Your name no. is not Sofia Coppola. Yeah. You know, your name doesn't come with all the connotations. So you and all the operate. pressures, uh, associated yeah. pressures. So you and, can operate yeah. under the radar no, even I get though it. you have won an Oscar. I, I get it, yeah. Uh, you're, yeah. At this stage, yeah, great. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it just allows me to get on with my work. And I, I don't really sort of um, beg for attention. I don't really, um, I've had a little taste of fame and all that, but there's are more important things in this in this yeah. life, in this world. So I'm, I, it's, yes, it's nice to just be able to get on with my work. Yeah. Because that's that's where I'm, where I'm at at the moment. Yeah. I mean, it's a similar position to Peter Capaldi. He won an Oscar that's for right, a short film. That's right, that's right, yeah. Uh, the same year Forrest Gump won. Yeah. yeah. And now look at him. Exactly. He's yeah. had a brilliant, brilliant career. Um, just a few final questions. Yes. Um, what advice can you give to anyone, young or old, who is just starting out on a creative life or a filmmaking life? What's the best advice that you can give to people in that position? I mean, it's a lot of what I've just been saying, really, um, my personal experience is that you, you have to you have to have the drive, you have to be ambitious, you have to go for it and not lose sight of your goal. Mm. Um, because there, there, there'll be innumerable, there'll be failures, there'll be things that don't work out for you, there'll be innumerable, innumerable um, obstacles um, that you have to overcome, but you have to, you have to keep on. And I, I feel that if you do keep on and you have the talent, then you will be given the opportunity to shine. And once you have that opportunity to shine, take it and, uh, and, um, yeah, as I was saying, you really have to believe in yourself as well. Um, there's so many things out there, so many people and, and, and things will try and, um, um, you know, bring sort you down. Shout you down. Yeah. Have but, you had that experience yourself? Yeah, no, totally, totally. But, I, you know, I've, 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 I've sort of overcome that and I've used that as fuel, actually, to, mm. to, to, um, to keep going. As creatives... We can all be plagued by this horrible internal voice that just says, mm, no, this isn't for you. You're not good enough. So how do you combat that voice, that internal voice? Um, I just look at my Oscar. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one to end on. Yeah, yeah. James, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank um, you for having me. Oh, well, it's Real a pleasure. Real pleasure. Yeah. Um, this has been the Iris Prize 2020 podcast. Be sure to subscribe on YouTube on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, and anywhere else that you get your podcasts. And find us on social media. It's all on the screen right now. Thank you very much for watching. We'll see you next time.